All right. So this topic is, is an interesting one. It's a new one, I think, for, for us and, and hopefully a little bit for the community. Um, we titled this, you know, what can we learn, the space community, if anything, from internet governance? And we asked that because, you know, we've been struggling in the space world with how to ch deal with some of these governance challenges and, and problems we talked about this morning, we're talking about a lot. And there have been some studies that have looked at other domains. There's a lot of comparisons to the air domain, the maritime domain. But we hadn't seen a lot of discussions of how things are done on the internet. Um, and we thought that was a really useful thing to, to, to focus on. And in particular, the governance challenges with how do you deal with the growing number and type of space actors, which include governments and industry and civil society and all the end users that are not only carrying out space activities, but are also impacted by things in space. They're end users that are reliant on the data even if they're not flying satellites. Traditional space governance fora uh, in the UN and elsewhere um, have some mechanisms to bring in some viewpoints from other stakeholders, but are mostly government-centric. Uh, and it's been challenging to figure out how to kind of broaden out that model. Um, and then to narrow down a little bit further for a kind of our focus, this key aspect of space situation awareness data, the stuff we use to know what's happening in space, there's sort of a growing recognition we have to share that between actors, we have to collate it, we have to fuse it. How do we do that? How do we put in place the standards and our operability to do that to then be able to go towards space traffic management? And so we're going to talk in this session about not only how that's sort of done today in the space world, um, but how some of these similar problems are, inter are addressed in the internet governance, and specifically organizations such as the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, and we're going to talk more about what those are, um, and what lessons they hold, uh, and maybe, maybe not, you know, this comparison is not saying it's 100% ideal, um, for space governance. So joining us to talk about this, uh, starting at my, my left and working our way down the stage, we have Richard Dalbello, Director of the Office of Space Commerce in the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, or sorry, administration, which is in turn part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Rich has a lot of experience both inside and outside government on space policy matters, and in his current job is responsible for developing civil space situation awareness and space traffic management capabilities for the U.S. government. Next up, we have Mallory Nodal. She's the Chief Technology Officer for the Center for Democracy and Technology, and is a member of the Internet Architecture Board and the co-chair of a Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group of the Internet Research Task Force. Um, and as you can probably guess, she has extensive experience in internet governance bodies and mechanisms. Next up, we have Bruce McClintock, who is the lead for the Space Enterprise Initiative and a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation, where his research focuses on the sustainability, safety, and security of space for the new space era. Next, we have Charlie McGillis, Senior Vice President, Government Relations and Strategy at Slingshot Aerospace, a company focused on improving space safety and optimizing orbital operations through space situation awareness, data, and services. And finally, we have Claire Otto, Senior Policy Analyst at the University of Virginia National Security Policy Center, where she contributes research on topics ranging from deterrence to domestic extremism. Notably for this discussion, Claire was an SWF Research Fellow last year and did a report for us on polycentricity and space governance. We're going to get into what those actually mean in, in a minute here. <laughs> um, a reminder for both our in-person audience and our virtual audience that we will be taking questions as we did for the previous session through the Whova platform. Uh, please make sure you're on the right session in the agenda so we'll be able to, I'll be able to see those, add in your questions, and I'll be working those in throughout the discussion. We also have a poll that's been open in Whova asking about the role of industry in space governance. Uh, we'll be getting to that a little bit later in our discussion, so please get your answer in already if you haven't, uh, and we'll be looking at those uh, responses uh, about halfway through. So Claire, I'd like to start with you and, and, and start with sort of the broader context for this shared governance approach to space. Now, as I mentioned in your intro, you did some research for us on what are known as common pool resources. Can you talk about what those are, how they relate to these questions about space, 
um, especially when it comes to this monitoring activities thing that we've been talking about. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you so much, first off. Um, really excited to be participating, and this is a very interesting topic. Um, so polycentricity, as you mentioned before, sounds a lot more complicated than it is. It's just the concept of multiple levels of governance all over the same area, area of responsibility. Um, so we see this in most governance systems that we, we have right now. Um, with that, and it's very related to common pool resources and the global commons. Um, space, there's the other Secure World Foundation fellow uh, from last fall, Daniel Patton, did a whole report on if space is a global commons. And uh, you can read the report, but he found out it's complicated. Um, <laughs> He looked into common pool resources, and looking at common pool resources and governance of the commons, you find that um, Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning work uh, found that there were eight principles for managing a commons, maintaining sustainability in uh, common pool resources, which most of them end up with having an efficient polycentric system, having an efficient system of shared governance. Um, Shared governance, polycentricity, allows for multiple levels of people to have input and modify rules when they need to, um, allows for uh, conflict resolution at lower and higher levels, um, and is just generally more flexible and responsive. Um, it does present a little bit of a challenge with defining clear boundaries and interoperability that I think uh, in my research we found with data sharing and um, space situational awareness sharing, but um, generally speaking, it allows for the flexibility and um, the multiple levels or the multiple sources of data uh, coming together to produce a more robust system. So, Charlie, I want to turn to you since Slingshot is involved in kind of how things currently work uh, with SSA. So. Can you kind of briefly summarize how SSA sharing is done today between the different data providers, satellite operators, and governments, um, as well as what existing standards exist or don't to enable that? Yeah. So thanks for, uh, it's great to be in here. Um, so it was mentioned in the first panel, you know, the Iridium Cosmos collision in 2009, and that's actually where the U.S. Strategic Command SSA sharing agreement started. So it started in 2009, I actually arrived at the command later that year. Um, but it's actually, from a U.S.-centric perspective, it's actually in uh, law that uh, the U.S. may not provide or may not provide SSA data or services unless a non-U.S. government agency enters into an agreement. So, and I'll get back to that. Um, so if the DOD system is being used to produce data, then you have to sign an SSA sharing agreement in order to use that data. So there's three levels of services that, that the Department of Defense offers today. There's a base, uh, an emergency service like there's going to be a crash. We have to get a hold of you. Let's, you know, do it. But there's also a basic uh, service, which actually includes what we call TLE, or two-line element set data. Um, and we call this kind of the general catalog. Um, but it's just TLE data, and I think we would all agree that that is not the way we should be making decisions. Um, and then the other one is more advanced services. And this actually uses... Um, what we would call the special perturbations catalog. It's a higher level catalog. It does take covariance into account, but that covariance is not shared. And so when those uh, messages are put out, we call them conjunction data messages, um, that isn't probably sufficient for owner operators to make those decisions. And being part of the commercial integration cell when I retired, you know, that was one of the things we tried to work on to get DOD to actually share that information. Um, so at a high level, DOD shares this information. Owner operators can put information into the um, space track dog org, as it is called today. Um, but it, you know, it is an owner operator gets to decide if they want to share that information with anybody else. There are two examples that I know of that do that, and that is Iridium shares their information freely. So Walt, thank you, um, and also Maxar. Um, so that information is shared, and that is a great best practice. Um, 
But the other thing is, um, you know, so then owner operators submit that, they can get it, you know, you can get maneuver recommendations, but it takes time. It's a DOD service. And so as Rich takes over that, right, I look forward to how he is going to take that law, right, and be able to actually enact it or change it, um, which is a big ask, right? So commercial providers like ourselves, that data is not included. It is not integrated into that system today. I know they're working that. Um, but it, it does make it un, uh, not persistent, right, from a data kind of perspective. They don't have the best data. And then you get into the what is, um, you know, what is the truth data, as I would call it, who validates that, and what are the standards for doing that, which I think really will be interesting of how we track that from a standard uh, perspective. And I'll stop there. And I think there's a lot of things we can pick up on yeah. that as we, as we go through this. Um, so, Mallory, I want to turn to you next. You've got a lot of experience in the world, the Internet governance, and how things like, you know, TCP IP and packets, the stuff that we don't even think about happens behind the scenes. And, you know, for a lot of us space nerds, and I might use that word, I'm one of those, right? We don't really know how that works. So if you could share a little bit um, about how the governance of the Internet works, specifically to sort of the technical standards and the interoperability and who gets a seat at the table? Sure. Well, I too am a nerd, so thanks for <laughs> inviting me. Um, this is a new domain for me. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of internet governance. That's the main part of my job. And of course, I could talk about it for a very long time. I'm going to keep the intro part short and try to hit the high points that I think can set us up for maybe some more discussion about the crossover or potential for thinking of internet governance as a model for space sustainability. Um, so I think it's useful to maybe think about, because um, you mentioned TCP IP, there's a really great, I'm a very visual person, so you could go on the internet and maybe um, look for um, the imagery of the, hour, the hourglass model of the way the internet works. This is meant to demonstrate that while you have on the sort of lower end more of the hardware, so this is where the... Um, mandates for standards um, coming out of the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers might come out. The, the satellites uh, would be down there as well. Um, undersea cables, the real infrastructure um, in our, you know, the network cards in our phones. And then at the top, you have things that are much more user facing, the applications, the platforms, the connective tissue between all of these different um, uses of internet communications um, that, that then interoperate. In the middle part, the small, narrow waistband is where TCP IP lives. That's the thing that connects it all. That's the thing that makes something internet or not internet. Um, and the really interesting part about that band is it's narrow because it's one protocol, first of all. Um, but it's also narrow because it is the only thing that you really need to use in order to connect to the rest of the network. So, while we think of the internet as one internet, and I would agree, um, it's also, the internet is a network of networks. So there's not too much overthinking when it comes to how one builds their own internet and then connects to the rest of the internet. That can be relatively bespoke or have its own certain quirks. We can still um, you know, connect in most places all over the world using um, TCP IP. And so then the governance that follows from that is really um, the sort of padding, I guess, around that protocol, uh, how you take just a technology but then um, support the use of that technology. And that has sort of been um, a whole story and a whole saga, right, that we could go into. We can start storytelling, um, you know, in the early, early 80s. There have been some interesting milestones in the early 2000s. But really what it's all built around is this desire to connect um, all these different networks, and so some of those networks have been built from the ground up. Not all networks are driven by companies. In the early days, a lot of them were driven by uh, governments. Um, and even still today, I have some dear colleagues that are building entire networks in um, hard to reach areas that are ostensibly community driven efforts, right? They're folks who've um, pooled their money together to buy you know, a mobile antenna um, they're using walks for cantinas. I mean, so it's a very sort of diverse space when you're actually talking about network operation. Um, and then 
to the governance question, which I think the main uh, question here is because you have all these different stakeholder groups actually doing the work, putting in the work, innovating and, and plugging things in, then you have a lot of people who have an opinion about how the network evolves or how um, you deal with thorny issues such as spam or resource allocation or the placement of, of new infrastructure. Um, and so it may differ in a lot of ways at this point from space because there's still a need to, to proliferate. And so one stakeholder group, one government, one, an effort by, by one centralized entity just would not be able to achieve that. Um, one of the things that, one of the milestones I have in mind to share with you was something called the IANA transition. This was when the US government essentially uh, gave up control of the global registry of the names and numbers allocation to a global multi-stakeholder process. And so IANA still functions, but it functions on its own, and it functions in between the ICANN group, which you've already mentioned the acronym, so I don't have to repeat it again, and the, and the IETF, uh, both of which I also work in. Um, in fact, ICANN is meeting right now in Washington, D.C. for the week, um, it's their second meeting of the year out of three. It's their policy meeting. Um, so for folks uh, interested in that, you can, of course, watch all of those things online because I can, like the IETF and like many of these bodies, are fully open um, and, and free for registration. Um, their proceedings are available. Their documents and their standards are all published uh, freely. Um, and so, of course, that's an, that's an interesting one that facilitates that, that um, governance. So I actually think I should stop there for now. And maybe if there are questions or other things you want to dive into, I can get further. Yeah, just one, 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 one real quick follow-up. So as I understand it, the couple of words you mentioned, ICANN is the organization that decides the .com, .net, that those, that we call the top-level domains, right, and who gets to operate those. And the IETF they design the technical standards, right, and the protocols. Exactly, and there are so many acronyms I could go even beyond right. those. But yeah, the ICANN serves, ICANN with IANA serves this really important function of the naming and numbering so that we can share this one resource um, and, and it's interoperable. So it's a very critical interoperable functionality. And in fact, ICANN is more of a policy organization where they, they overlap with the IETF in that the domain name system which is the TLDs and the IP addresses and everything, the, the technology that backs that is actually determined by the IETF. They write the protocols for how it works. ICANN manages the contracts because you don't actually ever own you know, .org or .gay or whatever. You are essentially renting it from ICANN. You have a contract with ICANN and there are certain terms of, under which they could revoke that contract. The only exception to that and this is maybe interesting for um, space context, is um, country code top-level domains, which have been allocated to every country in the world. And they are exempt from essentially every ICANN policy <laughs> because there's a, and this is an interesting UN quirk, where um, at some point the UN kind of gave ICANN this mandate, right? Um, acquiesced and, and allowed them to do that, unlike the telephone system, which is clearly um, managed by the ITU. Um, the country code top level domains and something called the governmental advisory committee are both sort of vestiges of governments having a different role than everyone else in the management of these resources um, as a way of sort of trying to replicate as best they can the big tent of the UN process where governments do have some degree of sovereignty over their jurisdiction. And that legend was how the internet works. Great. Okay. Um, so, Bruce, I want to turn to you. Your, your team at RAND has recently done a study, and I think we had some copies out front, um, comparing space governance to governance in other domains, uh, including the internet, but also several others. Can you kind of talk about the major findings, how it relates to this discussion? Yeah, thanks very much, Brian. And uh, thanks to you and Secure World Foundation for hosting this summit. Uh, it's a really important part of what we do together to maintain space sustainability and improve on it, and RAND's proud to be a sponsor of this event in particular. So as Brian mentioned, uh, we've got a report that we published just prior to this event, intentionally, and we talked about uh, the future of international space traffic management. Uh, one of the things that we did, and you'll see it, it's uh, the catchy headline that the time for international space traffic management is now. Uh, I want to qualify that. That's the top line up front. That's in RAND timelines, okay? So to put it in RAND perspective, our very first space-related report was our very first report, and it was written 11 years before Sputnik launched. <laughs> and it predicted 
that it was possible to launch a 500 kilogram satellite and that in the future, that all the things that we take for granted now would be accomplished through space. Satellite communications, navigation, Earth uh, remote sensing. Rand thought about all those things 11 years in advance. So to say the time for international space traffic management is now, you'll hear later where we talk about maybe within 10 years, okay? <laughs> uh, but I wanna be clear that it, we do believe that uh, we are at a tipping point. And I actually have uh, several of my Rand colleagues here in the audience that were part of the team, so <clears throat> thanks to them for that effort. If you have feedback, please give it to them um, or me as well, because we want to hear this. We want to be a part of this discussion for the long haul, because this is a long-term effort. So what did we do just very briefly, and then we'll get to some of the insights and recommendations. So what we did is, uh, kind of like Brian mentioned, there have been a lot of studies in the past about a future space traffic management system. Uh, so we scooped all those up. We analyzed those. Uh, there's a lot of error domain comparisons. There's a lot of analogies to uh, the maritime domain as well, and we said we're going to take at least one or two steps further, and we're going to look at other governance structures like ICANN. We briefly look at ICANN to analyze its approach. We also looked at uh, the SWIFT banking system, and we also looked at ITU, which people mention as well. Uh, and then we went a step beyond that, and we did a life cycle analysis of international governance organizations to figure out which ones survive and which ones die, which ones thrive, and which ones fail, if you will, uh, to come up with the best constructs or the best characteristics for those IGOs that really stand the test of time and actually serve the purpose that they're designed for. Uh, and then once we took all that into account, we came up with a couple, I'll just hit on a couple key insights and key recommendations. Uh, the first one, I'm, I'm preaching to the, the choir here on this, and we've heard it all morning long, uh, but specific to space traffic management, we conclude that the world is approaching a space traffic management tipping point. The congestion is growing. The lack of coordination or rules of the road is such that uh, we're getting to the points where the uh, collisions that are now rare but have happened already, uh, satellite on satellite collisions, are going to become more frequent in the future unless we come up with a system that coordinates across those enterprises. And by the way, you have to have an SSA system before you have a space traffic management system. So glad to see that Rich is here to talk about that as well. <laughs> uh, we also conclude, uh, to, this isn't Rand speak, but to put it simply, it's time to stop admiring the problem, okay? Over the past 40 years, there have been more than a dozen very significant reports and studies and analysis done on the, exactly this topic about space traffic management or international space traffic management. And we cite them all in our report. Uh, so it's time to stop just admiring the problem and actually doing something about it. So what should we do about it? The top two line recommendations from Rand our first and foremost, we recommend an, an International Space Traffic Management Convention be convened within the next five years and establish an implementation plan for the next 10 years. So again, that's that now from RAND perspective, so that we actually have an international governance system that allows the different stakeholders, and we include all the stakeholders, we include industry, NGOs, uh, governments, of course, in that conversation so that we can come up with a system that gives us a sustainable uh, space for the future. I want to point out, and you can read it in the report as well, we don't explicitly advocate for the UN to be the host for this event. Uh, we do uh, model off of some other UN activities, but we want to point out, there's a lot of times when the UN, it's a little bit harder. We did hear some encouraging things this morning from our first uh, keynote speaker. It's harder for the UN to take in this multi-stakeholder approach sometimes, right? So I was encouraged by what I heard this morning about uh, other approaches to that. The other, I'll touch on one more recommendation from the report, and it goes to exactly the, the point of this panel. We talk about learning from past successes, okay? So we, we essentially say, don't just template, don't say, well, we need an IKO for space, or we need an UNCLOS for space, or we need ITU to take on the mission of uh, space traffic management. We don't believe that's the right solution. The right solution is a best practices approach that takes into account all those characteristics that we outline in the report, right? Many of which come from ICANN, a system that started as an NGO and then, as you mentioned, transferred to an international structure. Uh, so there's a lot to benefit from there, and that's why we give that five and 10 year period of time so that we can get the stakeholders together to build off the best practices that already exist, not just from air and maritime domains, and come up with a system that will stand the test of time. So I'll stop there, Brian. Well, that's great. Um, so I'm going to turn you to Rich next because you're tasked with leading the U.S. government efforts on solving a lot of these problems. So 
We're going to need an update on that, please. Um, <laughs> yeah, we got it. It's all under control. <laughs> um, but so specifically, I mean, so so far the top question of the audience is, what is an update on, on how that is all going? But also, how does this discussion so far relate to what the, the problems you guys are trying to tackle and what you're working on? Um, you know, what about this do you find useful? Just a bunch of us, you know, inter, you know, wonks here talking in, in general, or you know, how relevant is the challenges your office has on civil SSA and the international coordination piece of that? Okay, there, there's actually a lot going on globally, but we need to, I mean, I, I agree with Bruce and Rand in the broad strokes, but there's so much detail and granularity to get to any of those conclusions. So where are we right now? We, we've just come out of a period where really the only true source for, the only globally available source for SSA was the US uh, Air Force, now Space Force, um, that was metered out in different levels of, uh, the information was metered out in different levels of clarity, depending on who you were, with very general information given out and very, to, to the public, but very specific information to some people. What that has spawned is not an internet-like coming together, but what it has spawned is as, you know, all nations have great mathematicians and theoretical scientists. What we're seeing now is the proliferation of SSA systems. The EUSST is, the, is I think, uh, is now up and running, uh, offering services uh, as we go around the world. Um, obviously, China and Russia already have their own independent capabilities. So what we're actually seeing is not a coming together, but an atomization of the SSA marketplace. And within the US, because you know, there's sort of hyperactivity, because we have not only is the government involved, but we have a number of really capable US companies involved, including Slingshot. Um, and so th what we are getting now to the point where there are a number of answers out there that you can drive. And co countries are feeling comfortable saying, oh, we, we have our own system. The problem is, is that the math doesn't work that we don't today have a way to compare the results of two independent systems and know truth and to be able to define truth. And so we have right now, I think not to um, make this about China, but China is a good example of a country that has a very sophisticated space program. They also have very smart engineers and they are able to do SSA at a very, very sophisticated level. Uh, they have declined to share information with the rest of the world. So we do have issues where U.S. providers, including Planet, uh, um, uh, we just heard from uh, Mark uh, about Planet's commitment, but Planet and others like Starlink uh, have, by the China's estimation, come close to their human, sp human space station. We say they didn't. They say they did. We're in, again, we're in a world where everyone has their, we're in a world where everyone has their truth today. So if you ask me, are we coming together? The answer is no, we're going apart. And well, okay, then if you, if you accept that, then what do you do? Well, then you have a lot of hard work to do. Because first of all, the bunch of stuff that already had happened in the internet has not yet happened. There has to be a coming together on standards and best practices, best practices, are more at the UN level, standards are more at the IEEE or ISO or other levels. So we need to drive a conversation which is, okay, realize we all have our own truth today, let's agree on how we get there, so what are the standards for data, for data storage, for data transfer, and, there's, and then there's an entirely separate conversation that has to happen between the people who are running those systems, whether they be governments or commercial entities, there has to be a separate dialogue with satellite operators, the people who are actually flying the satellites. So not surprisingly, not all satellite operators are created equal. There are sophisticated operators and there are unsophisticated operators. There are new and, and experienced operators. All of those people have different levels of practice and, and some of them know where their satellites are and some of them don't. 
So what we have to have is a dialogue or with some both. Some may think they know where their satellites and are. And that yeah. is even worse. <laughs> so we have to have an international dialogue where we agree on not only what are standards, the critical standards for SSA, but also what are the best practices, and also from an operator perspective, what can what do governments need to require from satellite operators in terms of information? As it was pointed out previously, uh, some companies are already sharing their, their satellite information widely, some don't. Some companies who are prepared to share their information, we're not sure if their information is that good. Okay, because this gets back to how good is the operator at knowing where they are. So we have layers and layers and layers. And as I always say, we're pretty good at something that we need to be consistently excellent at. And so we are all on a journey, not just the commercial sector and the operators, but the governments. We're on a journey to get better, and, but we are not yet good today. We're not good enough today. If you think about air traffic control, when you're landing in a crowded airspace like JFK or Dulles, you, you actually don't want them to be guessing where the other planes are. You'd really <laughs> like to know that they know where everything is. And we'd really like to be there, but honestly, we are not there today. So in terms of governance, I think I look, there are some elements of what is going on in, um, in the internet realm that I'd like to replicate. The coming together, the agreeing on standards, agreeing on the agreement, agreements around operator responsibility. I'd like to see those things come together, and we're going to do everything we can to encourage those things. Um, uh, on other things, I think the government is going to have to have a heavier hand, um, both in providing the service, uh, the initial service, and also sort of setting up the first rule set. Uh, and just quickly, uh, give us a kind of a quick summary of where you guys are with tracks and, and, and the, the effort of the Department of Commerce to try and address some of these things. Well, uh, we got our first real budget this year, so we were super excited, and we were able to start moving out. We, uh, this summer, we're going to have, uh, we did some initial, some initial pilot work uh, back last Christmas, uh, which was really informative to sort of baseline where our commercial sector is. We also have a, a pilot program with the European, the EU SST on data sharing uh, to understand how their system looks to our system. Um, so that's in, an, and we are reaching out to other countries. So two levels of things. This uh, next month, we're going to be doing a series of meetings with satellite operators to have a dialogue about what should be required for for high quality SSA in terms of data that we need from operators. We're also going to be doing a series of meetings with SSA providers to understand um, the basics of what they believe the, the fundamental requirements for standards are for data and for other things. So we are very much in the we need to start pulling people together. There will be an international element to our work, and we're just at the very beginning of it right now. Mm -hmm. So, Claire, I want to go back to you. Um, so you talked about sort of the, the high-level concepts. Uh, based on, on your research, so what do you see as the main challenge we should be working on to get at this question of uh, coming together on a, on a collective, you know, we know what's going on in space answer? Um, you know, what are the key characteristics of a SSA data sharing governance framework that need to be there for it to be successful? Yeah, I mean, um... It's going to be reductive, I think, after all of this discussion, but I think the first thing really is to prioritize and decide what level decisions need to be made at. Um, there are multiple levels, which um, there's this great article by uh, Mariel Borowitz at Georgia Tech uh, who looks at the SSA networks now um, and kind of where, where partnerships are and where decisions are. And she does, in some of it, highlight that um, a network of capabilities, of, of SSA capabilities or data sharing capabilities where um, different, different entities cover different gaps. There may be commercial data that can provide uh, a little bit of a different look than government data um, can be a benefit. But I think before, before we get to that part, before that that's useful, um, there needs to be decisions about what, what standards need to be set um, at a higher level, kind of productively, but um, before we can decide where, um, 
kind of where to set norms, the the government needs to decide which ones are for for international bodies, which ones are for national bodies, and then which um, can be decided among commercial providers or um, you know smaller smaller sort of subnational entities. Um, I'm actually interested in with the the internet governance if the international bodies have much discussion amongst each other. Uh, you had mentioned, you know, like ICANN, IETF, and IANA. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions now. Well, but. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get around to that. We'll get, we'll, we'll, um, that's sort of part of what Max's question to her is. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so then I think dividing, defining what level is best to drive uh, connections and what level is best to decide what the standards are. Um, I think kind of relatedly, and this personally I believe is, is something for a, a higher body, like a, an international body or um, a national kind of leadership would be just clear definitions of standards, clear definitions of, um, you know, you had mentioned like there's no way to really define what truth is now. Uh, that seems like something to me that is the first step before you can really talk about how to organize anything, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, so I, I wanna bring up our poll results because that really gets to sort of the, uh, the next part of this question. Because uh, to me, as I look at the way the internet is, is, is organized and the governance piece, to me the big difference with the space world is that it's not just governments having a say in the rules, right? We talk of this word multi-stakeholder, and I'll ask you to explain a little more what that means, Mallory. Um, but where governments and industry and civil society all share responsibility and have a shared say in establishing some of the things on the internet. Um, so we asked this poll question uh, for when it comes to space, should companies have equal say to governments in at least some aspects of space governance, uh, such as SSA data sharing? Uh, because this, this is really a big change for, for the space world. As we heard about in the first panel this morning, the United Nations is a government-only body, uh, and while some private sector entities are allowed to come and are brought by delegations to provide comments and input, the decisions are all made by the governments. Uh, so, so that's why I wanted to focus on this, and I think it's, it's pretty interesting. There's a little more yes than no, uh, but it's certainly not overwhelmingly one way or the other, and the question was definitely posed a little bit uh, uh, posed to make that a little more difficult question or challenge. Um, so Mallory, I want to turn to you and, and sort of, you know, would that be as controversial in the internet world or the internet world sort of say, yes, they should have a role there? And, and what are some of the challenges and shortcomings of how the multi-stakeholder internet governance bodies evolved that we should be thinking about in the space world if we're going to go maybe a similar path? Sure, and I, it would be very controversial to say that only governments get to control the internet. And in fact, um, you know, a lot of my work, so I, I also should self-identify as a part of civil society, and I've never actually worked for a company or a government, so I'm, you know, 15 years working for um, human rights organizations and things like that. And I have a technical background, and increasingly you see, um, you know, international human rights organizations hiring uh, digital technologists just because of the risks to, of AI and like other things. So it's becoming more common, but back when I started, um, it was not common at all to have a human rights organization um, hire a, an internet specialist. But um, anyway, so, so yeah, even, even now a lot of our work is in fact to uh, think about the mandate. So this goes to Claire's question. Mandate does become important. There are certainly, uh, there's territory. Right? And some of it's like pretty well staked out, but there's always going to be overlap, and there are liaison ships for that. So ISO, for example, has um, pages upon pages of liaisons. They get very fine-grained. Every single you know, task group or working group has a liaison to something else. Um, the IETF, um, in broad strokes, has the major ones. Right, They want to organize with the ITU um, to um, the least extent possible. Actually, they want to organize a little bit with 3GPP. It's useful for them, for them to know what's happening in the Wi-Fi standardization at the IEEE, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think it's important that those, are, those overlaps are, are um, reinforced. You know, it's, it's not actually a good thing if liaisons aren't talking to each other. Um, it might just mean that there's not a lot to, to say over the course of a few years, but it, it Ideally, you have a tighter loop 
um, so that you don't, I guess, have different standards that end up conflicting with one another or, or at the very least, uh, confusion over who really has ownership over a thing. So the ITU and the IETF probably work as closely together as they, as they need to on that. Um, and then, um, you know, I think the companies having a say, right, is really goes back to this question of um, capacity, capability. Um, we also imagine uh, the governments are not the same. They're not monolith. Uh, there's a lot of countries, uh, especially in the global south, that have less capacity to engage in internet governance than, say, my organization of 40 people. So we have to imagine that you know, even if you think about a government-only space, you're going to have a lot of very different engagement from different parts of the world. And that matters quite a lot. I mean, also because as far as I understand, I do have a degree in physics, the, the, you know, the satellites that you'd be delivering communications are only for a certain part of the world and for other parts like are rather negligible because they don't necessarily work there. Um, I just think that those complexities are really important to uncover. Um, the different capacities and different roles are, are actually something that we should embrace and not um, be too worried about or over-index on uh, you know, who's doing what. And, and I can only say that because of these hard problems, more is more. And so companies having an opinion, you might even imagine um, most affected parties that maybe wouldn't be aligned with companies or governments also having an opinion from time to time, that actually that is only helpful and additive uh, to the deliberations that you might encounter. And that's definitely something that I talk a lot about in the internet governance space where, yes, I might be working for a nonprofit organization, but in fact, if you consider end users or the public interest um, whatever standard you're working on will be better for it. So please let us sit down at this table and <laughs> talk with you all. <laughs> uh, Charlie, I want to go back to you. Uh, you know, Slingshot is one of the companies looking to build a business model in part on SSA data and services. What do you think about this maybe shift to a multi-stakeholder approach? Um, does that fit into how you guys see things evolving? What is your perspective on that? Yeah, so we would be a company that would support that companies should have as equal say as governments um, because we want to be a part of the solution. And so our concern is that it's going to take too much time, hopefully not ran time, um, <laughs> to get something going, right? I mean, the time is now, and I think we all would agree to that. Um, and so as we've built out our platform and have ingested our data, we want the best possible data to be available to operators and for people to make decisions, the best decisions, right? And so we calibrate our systems. We ensure that that data is, you know, the best that it can possibly be. And so as we get owner-operator ephemeris data into our platform, we check it, you know? So there should be standards set, in, you know, Slingshot's opinion, Charlie's opinion, um, that we know how to uh, supply that data, ingest it into other systems, like in the track system that uh, Richard's going to build, right? We want to make sure that that data goes in there. There is a standard for that. Is it kilometers? Is it meters? Everybody's using that same standard. Everybody agrees to that. And so for us, it is about making sure even our cabinet mates, you know, the other SSA providers out there, DOD has, you know, the data is uh, good data and that it can help in that decision-making process. Um, and so there are things that we can do, you know, we want to check the data, we want to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with, it is secure, um, and that there, I call it a fingerprint, like if, if data comes in, analytics are performed on it, I want to know, what, an, what data was used to do those analytics. And so fingerprinting that data, make sure it carries through. And there are technical systems today that, could, you know, it's not rocket science, I don't think. Um, you know, it, the technicality of it isn't what's going to get us. It's the governance and the standards and setting that up that's going to, and everybody agreeing to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here from the audience that I, I, I think hopefully Mallory can address, which is how this stuff on the internet side is funded, like how are the ICANN, ITF things funded? Um, but I'll, I'll let you answer that. But also, Bruce, uh, you said you looked at sort of the life cycle of some of these organizations. If you can maybe chime in on how that funding monetization is done in some of the other domains uh, once Mallory talks about the internet piece. 
I don't know. Sure. They're all differently funded, um, and that does have an impact on the way their processes work. So the World Wide Web Consortium is membership only. So if you are a browser or a large um, advertising network, you would pay annually to be able to be part of the standardization process. Um, the IETF, um, you can be, there's no membership. You can just show up on mailing lists and all of that engagement is free. But if you want to come to a meeting, you have to pay. They meet three times a year. Um, you pay for your attendance of the meeting, essentially. And they also use companies to sponsor the meetings. Uh, and they're working meetings, so they aren't panel presentations. If you're in an IETF meeting, people have their laptops out and they're wordsmithing documents the entire time. Um, ICANN is, uh, ICANN prints money <laughs> because they own the domain system. That must be so, nice. <laughs> absolutely, they don't have any problems with money whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, there is, I, they would probably be curious to me saying that, but it is absolutely true um, compared to the rest of the internet. So, if you have a finite resource and you can, anyway, I'm just kidding. But, um, yeah, so they all have really different models. I know the ITU, um, because, you know, it is government only, that has a different model, it has different funding challenges. Um, I was even just like checking my re recollection of the, the World Summit for the Information Society, which was hosted by the ITU that really kicked off the way the Internet's governed today about 23 years ago or so. Um, and I looked at how it was funded. It was really interesting. The U.S. didn't fund it. But uh, Sweden, or sorry, Switzerland and Canada really kicked in a lot. And there were some surprising show, there was some, some surprising show from Global South countries as well. So these things are often, um, there's no one uh, tried and true method. Bruce, anything to add from what you guys looked at? Yeah, just a couple of comments. So first of all, very Rand-esque. Uh, I'm going to parse the question that you asked, and I think it was probably written in a, a provocative way. But to say have, a, have an equal share is nearly a non-starter, frankly, okay? Because there's things like the Outer Space Treaty out there that assign uh, responsibility to nation states for owner-operators. But I think we would agree that uh, both owner-operators, so that is commercial entities, NGOs, and nation states should all have some say in the process, right? So a little bit of a parsing of the question, but I think that might be why you got some uh, ambiguous results there, doing some random analysis from here. Um, <laughs> so what I would tell you is I'm going to quote a couple of statements from the uh, report on the IGO piece to get back to your question, and then uh, there's, there's a lot more work to be done here, why I do think it will take time. Uh, before I do that, I will say, there's already excellent, in my opinion, this is not part of our specific research, work underway. I'm going to throw um, compliments to Space Safety Coalition. I know that Slingshot's a signatory to that. They just released in May some best practices for uh, sustainable space behaviors. And there's some specific details in there, exactly the kind of things that Charlie was talking about, right? We, don't, we can't wait on governments who are doing hard work at their domestic levels to come up with these standards because... There's too much going on out there right now, right? So coming up with those specific standards, is it kilometers or miles or nautical miles or you know, what's a safe separation distance? What are rules of the roads? Th those are all examples of things that we saw in our analysis over the course of history in other domains. It usually starts with the commercial entities because they have a financial stake in the situation and they are the ones that want to turn a profit, right? They want to survive as a business and they need to move out quickly. And that's why going all the way back, maybe not all the way back to Grotius, but uh, to the Hanseatic League of the 1100s where they had arrangements about, okay, how much are each of us going to pay for uh, insurance claims on a ship? And it's going to be based on weight if a ship sinks. You know, it's that level of detail. Governments didn't do that. Industry did that, right? So I'm all about, we are all about the fact that it needs to be a multi-stakeholder approach. But a lot of those details aren't fleshed out yet. Some things are fleshed out based on our analysis. Uh, quote, successful IGOs are cooperative, collaborative, inclusive, and their creation and design should be based on consensus to ensure legitimacy. Uh, one point I'd make, consensus does not mean unanimity, right? So this is one of the things that we would strike out from like the UN approach to the system, okay? Most of these successful governance structures that we found, like ICANN, like some of the other ones, like SWIFT, they have board structures. They have different uh, working group bodies and things like that that actually contribute bottom up for the standards, and then they get to a structure where they actually say, okay, well, everybody gets a vote, but just because you veto doesn't mean that we're not going to move out on this specific standard. So that's an important trait there. Another important trait, lasting intergovernmental organizations, IGOs, need data, information, and measurements that are reliable and trustworthy to ensure situational awareness, inform decision-making, and help resolve disputes. That seems obvious, 
But as uh, Rich pointed out, it's not always clear, right? Uh, so I might, again, parse words a little bit. There is, in fact, truth in space. Where an object is, is, is a fact, right? Different people sense that in different ways, so they have errors in their sensing, right? Where we start getting into a more of a gray area where it's very different from ICANN and SWIFT, right? The SWIFT banking system wouldn't work if different entities came in and said, well, I believe that that transaction was you giving me a million dollars, and you believe that that transaction was you giving me $30, right? You have to have a, a, an established set of facts that everybody's working from. Where we run into some challenges for space, that's true in other domains too, Rich kind of touched on this, is the predictive aspect of space traffic management. That doesn't come up in ICANN, right? It's a system for passing specific data, but there are other systems that address this. And I like to use the, the hurricane track analogy, right? So visual learner too, right? When you have hurricanes or tsunamis in another part of the world, there's multiple tracks because you have multiple sources of people trying to predict where this hurricane is gonna go, right? And nobody is going to get it 100% right because they are trying to predict the future. And you can't predict weather 100% accurately, and especially the further out you get. That's why those tracks widen, right? But all those tracks come together in some kind of a database or repository that pulls the best of breed from all of those. And there's ratings for that too, right? So if in the future China's system is lying all the time, well, they're going to get an F grade, and they're not going to get as much weighting in a future system as, say, the European Space Agency system because it's much more accurate, uh, but maybe it's not as good as the United States system. However, the United States isn't as good about always sharing stuff that they don't want other people to know about either, so they don't get an A grade either, right? So it's that kind of a weighting system that contributes to this consensus-driven, uh, inclusive approach to governance. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that, Bruce. And, and, and yes, the question was deliberately a little bit provocative on that. Um, and this issue of in the space world, the Outer Space Treaty gives states the responsibility for national space activities to provide authorization and continuing oversight. And Matt, I don't think there's anything exists like that in the internet world, right? There, there's no such kind of foundational thing. So that is one unique aspect of space that maybe means we can't entirely copy exactly what's going on. Um, uh, so thank you for bringing that up, Bruce, because that, that addresses that question. Um, Rich, there's a couple of questions here that I want to uh, bring to you. One is, um, if you could talk a little bit more about how the information from satellite operators and commercial asset providers is going to be brought into tracks, or how you guys are thinking about using that. Um, and also, you know, if, if companies want to, be prepared, want to participate in these dialogues, what do they need to prepare for? Okay, so start out really quickly with who are the, what are the different interest groups? Because I think this is relevant because it's also not like the internet. So we have a group of, of people who are actually doing something, satellite operators, their communication services, remote sensing systems, that the purpose of their whole business is to create a product, to sell something in a marketplace, okay? Those people are the the primary, and there are, of course, a lot of government activities in space, but let's put that aside for now. So you've got this broad, robust commercial space segment. They don't produce the SSA data, right? So right now, we started out with a singular source, which, is govern, which was the government of the United States, and now governments as these systems proliferate. So when you first question of um, uh, who pays for this, Right now, the governments are paying for it because the operators, we could pass the burden if we could get a global agreement. We could pass the burden to the users of space and say, well, we're just going to tax all you. We've all agreed that if you're a user of space, you get taxed for safety, you know, like you get taxed on gasoline for, for, road, for road safety. That is not a preferred method right now, and I think would go badly if we tried to do that. Um, but so as the world gets more complicated and there are more and more SSA providers, the issue of who pays will be one which continually gets battered around. And, and there are analogies to this in a more sophisticated way in air traffic control, where you have some countries that actually have privatized their air traffic control networks and other countries who regard it as a, a government a government responsibility. So I just wanted to get that out there, the, these different groups, and they have different interests. So how are we going to work closely with 
the commercial sector. That's part of the reason that, that we've kicked off this, these what we're calling operator engagement sessions where we're gonna be working closely with the satellite operators themselves and then the SSA providers themselves, the commercial US SSA providers uh, separately because we wanna hear the voice of the satellite operator distinctly. Um, and we want to understand what they're willing to do, what they're willing to share, and we want to push them a little bit on sharing because we think there are some better practices that are currently, that are currently done. Um, and so it is our goal to work directly with the people who are the satellite operators to understand what stresses are they under, um, what's working, what's not working. Uh, there are these products, the U.S. data products from the mil U.S. military, but also from the EUSST. Where are those falling short? What doesn't exist that they'd want to see? Um, we do get a lot of calls for something that I'll characterize as kind of a concierge service, which is you know people, particularly young companies, want someone they can literally call and talk to <laughs> about how to do this kind of stuff. More sophisticated companies don't need that. They don't even want to talk to anybody. They just want things connected by API so they get machine, data. And machine to machine, right? Machine yeah. to machine, they don't want to talk to people. So <laughs> you know, one of the things we have to come, we have to wrestle with is how do, we, how do we deal with this diversity of users, some of who want really hand-holding and uh, some who just want data and please get out of the way. Yeah. Um, and so Part of that is we have, to, we have to start talking, and that'll be a domestic dialogue initially, then a broader international dialogue. So we have just a few minutes left here. Uh, one more honest question I want to get to, and it's th this question of how do you deal with bad actors, uh, which we talk about all the time in the space community. Um, and and Melon, I want to ask you to talk about first, how do you deal with bad actors in the internet governance system that may be kind of you know, doing things that are irresponsible, um, and then if anybody else wants to weigh in on, on how the space world should think about that in this context. But Mallory, please. Yeah, it's really challenging. I would just affirm that. So wait, you haven't solved this problem? No, uh, not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we have issues. We also think, let me start again. We have a moment still that is maintained, but for how long, we don't know, where um, connectivity at all costs is fully aligned with human rights. More connectivity, free flow of information, people online, all good. We all agree censorship is bad. We agree surveillance is a problem, et cetera. So there, for the most part, is kind of two issues. One is like kind of a more minor but completely proliferated issue of spam, right? That's definitely a bad actor. We have entire governance structures just on the problem of spam. There's something called MOG. It's a bit of a weird acronym, but it's M3AAWG. They meet three times a year to deal with spam on the internet. Um, then there's the big problem, which is states. So states, different <laughs> approaches to jurisdictional control over communications varies wildly, right? And that, you can see a big uh, milestone, a big moment um, around 2011 when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State and um, with the government of the Netherlands sort of spun up a lot of infrastructure and funding around internet freedom, helping people um, in places where there is more repression, be sort of free and protected from that repression, um, and tries to, at some level, level the playing field, either by giving folks who are at risk of, of repression via digital means more tools to circumvent those um, tools of repression or get around them, or um, maybe more focus, I would say, should, should happen, but that's changing around this sort of top-down diplomatic approach to smoothing some of that over. It's not going well. Um, <laughs> as you'll see, China's in the news a lot around TikTok and the Great Firewall and all those things, but it's happening sort of at those two levels. Um, and so, yeah, it, it just requires an enormous amount of patience. Um, but cooperation is encouraged. It's the antidote to a lot of this, and so that's actually a good thing because we, it's something you can fix. Bruce, you want to chime in? Yeah, yeah I th oh, sorry, Bruce and then Rich, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so just very briefly, uh, you, of course, you are the expert on ICANN, but I definitely agree. There are other systems out there. It's the enforcement that becomes the biggest challenge at the end of the day, right? And so um, Always is. One of my colleagues, Doug Lagore, who's here, would say that, you know, that's why we need treaties rather than norms. Uh, I tend to come from the bottom up. Uh, there are mechanisms. It's not built into SWIFT, but I'll give you an example. SWIFT, uh, the banking system, we just briefly studied it. But there are 
sometimes you just actually have to like pull the trigger and do things like start cutting people out of the system, like the United States and other nations have done with Russia, given what's they're, what they're doing in Ukraine, right? Uh, so it comes to that. We hope it doesn't come to that. We didn't get a lot of time to study it, uh, but as you were mentioned, some, uh, some people referred to it as tax. We like the term orbital use fees or tradable satellite performance bonds specifically. That's an area that uh, we believe uh, warrants more study because what you do is you now have not just a fee on the fact that you put a satellite on orbit, but your fee is based on your behavior and how sustainable your behavior is, right? So it's like this, this gradated kind of rewards for good behavior. It's kind of like the insurance company that says, if you're a good driver, you get a good driver discount, right? If you're a good satellite operator, you get a good satellite operator discount. Uh, but if you're a bad actor, you're actually cut out of the system. Now, how do you actually cut somebody completely out if they have things on orbit? That's the really hard part. But not complying with a space traffic management mechanism, it's easier to do that because now you can hold them accountable. And there's so many other data sources out there. It's not a single actor or a Cold War era approach anymore. There, there are a lot of providers for that kind of information. So, And there is global accountability. So it's not a perfect system, but there are ways to address it. So we're out of time, but Richard, you want to chime in with the Just last Just quickly word here? to yep. say the tool set for U.S. regulators is relatively modest right now. I mean, pretty much the most active tool that we have would be the FCC license. We, you have to have a license before you can launch a satellite to space. Um, the FCC has in the past, with bad actors, threatened to yank that license. Um, really, really kind of a dull tool for a very complicated uh, pro uh, problem. So going forward, we need a, the governments are going to government our government and governments are going to need a better tool set. Well, um, this was just the beginning of this conversation. You see, there's lots of other things to unpack and discuss. I know we at Secure will be interested in exploring this further. Uh, but please join me in thanking our speakers.